Hello, my name is Sam Falvo. You're watching a video on how I'm going to apply forth to solve a text preprocessing problem. This video kicks off what I hope to be a series of videos where the viewer kind of watches over my shoulder while listening to me explain the rationale of my actions. But first, uh, I do have to get some legalese out of the way. First, it is licensed under Creative Commons, attribution share alike. You are free to share and to remix, to copy, distribute, display, and perform the work as well as to make derivative works. But you may do so only under the following uh, conditions. You must attribute. You must attribute this work to Samuel A. Falvo II, and you must share alike. If you alter, transform, or build upon this work, you may distribute the resulting work only under the same, similar, or a compatible license. For any reuse or distribution, you must make clear to others the license terms of this work. The best way to do this is to simply link to the web page that you're viewing now. Any of the above conditions can be waived if you get permission from me, the copyright holder. And apart from the remix rights granted under this license, nothing in this license impairs or restricts the author's moral rights. Alrighty. Business has been done, so let's get started. All right, so as you can see, I'm sitting here in a lovely temporary directory here. You could actually do this pretty much anywhere. I'm going to be using GForth for this because that's the fourth environment that I'm most familiar with. So let's start with the backstory here. Recently at, at work at my office, uh, I found myself in need of, of something akin to a literate programming tool, which satisfied several requirements. First, it had to emit plain HTML somehow. The desired deliverable was a hacker's guide for a tool I had written so that others in my office can support that tool as well. It had to fit on our co uh, corporate JotSpot wiki. No cascading style sheets, no embedded images, and no JavaScript, as JotSpots really cannot handle these features at all. Second, the command set had to be easy to use. Since I was documenting a program in Python, uh, I used the tilde symbol because it almost never appeared in my source code uh, so that uh, uh, it reduces the need to escape the escape character. I find that I can type the tilde very well easily uh, uh, on my keyboard. Additionally, I really didn't want to have to type in closing and opening constructs back to back all the time, like um, this, which occurs quite frequently in HTML and XHTML. Uh, I had to hide that as much as possible. Third, I make reference to various websites on the net, and I'd like to use a consistent method of citing them. I use a format inspired by the MLA Association, uh, so basically the citation in the work cited, uh, I wanted to use that uh, or reuse that format since it's pretty well known. Fourth, the tool either had to pre-exist or in the absence of a timely solution, had to be trivially easy to create myself. After spending about two hours browsing the web for potential leads, I came to the conclusion that it would be just much faster if I just wrote it myself. I had to decide if I wanted to write it in Python or in Forth. Uh, Python approximates Lisp in that it's a very high level language and relatively easy to code for. But because of its voluminous uh, uh, API library, I, I knew that I would be uh, spending a lot of time you know, reading, uh, you know, reading library APIs and so forth that uh, I knew would slow me down. So in the end, fourth one out. Uh, again, I found it somewhat faster to just whip up my own code. And finally, fifth, I didn't need the full set of literate programming features. While they're nice to have, uh, the end result I was looking for was some easy documentation for an application which I had already written. Uh, not to recreate a totally new literate programming tool for use in a new project. Although, having come this far, perhaps with a little bit of time and patience, I might refine it to become just such a tool, uh, just to prove that Forth is actually a viable programming language, too. And we'll see, though. It's definitely not high on my list of priorities. Furthermore, before I continue, I must point out that I will not be unit testing this code. Illustrating test-driven development in its rawest form uh, would effectively double the length of this presentation. And I predict this is going to take about an hour as it is. So 
Um, so I'm just going to defer uh, that demonstration for a later video if, if, if there is interest. Also, I have already wor written a working copy of what you're going to see in this video, so if it looks like I can just conjure up fourth incantations at will uh, while you sit there and stare dumbfoundedly at the screen, drooling, wondering where and how I can get uh, do this, please remember that I have at least a few days more experience than you do. Really, a few days. I wrote this tool about three days ago, and as you might expect, I'm using it as a guide for creating this video. Uh, I'm, I've already gone through my debugging phase. So without further ado, for my purposes, I know that I want to read in a source file and write out a destination file. So let's start with the basics. We can't do anything with the data unless we actually get it into the computer first. We commence our coding with attempting to read in the source file. Before we actually read in the source file, we need to put it someplace in memory. Unlike Lisp or Python, memory management is very explicit in fourth. So we're going to use the dictionary, specifically a lot, to reserve space that we need uh, to hold the input file. So we're going to start out with a simple test, just to make sure that my idea is fairly cogent. And we're going to call this program weave.fs again named after the litter programming tool of, of choice. So I'm gonna start I'm gonna start with uh, defining some useful constants here. This is going to be the source file. Uh, it's going to be in the temporary directory slash temp slash a. Um, it is a plain text string so if you're using this under Windows it would probably see, be something like C colon backslash temp backslash whatever. Uh, you can put this in, in source file pretty much anywhere. Um, if you're really adventurous and you're, and you're um, not particularly interested in, uh, in writing super portable code, most fourth pro, uh, compilers will uh, support access to command line arguments as well. Um, but I'm not so concerned about command line arguments. Basically, I knew exactly where I wanted to put the data and I knew I wanted to have a consistent place to pick it up. So I'm, I'm happy with hard coding file names. Next, we're going to deal. Uh, we're going to slurp uh, the entire uh, source file into memory. Slurp is a technical term. Um, basically, it says I'm going to read the entirety of this object into memory. And the way we do that, uh, we're going to start uh, our buffer. We're going to read in some amount of space, which in this case we're going to emulate 100 bytes, and then we're going to finish. And the reason we want to start and finish is because, as, as indicated previously, um, fourth has very explicit memory management, so we want to properly frame uh, when we start and when we stop dealing with the uh, input buffer. Pick source is the address of the source buffer, and hash source is the number of source uh, buffer elements. In other words, this is the address, this is the size of, of the, uh, the buffer. <coughs> <coughs> now notice that we're also using short, generally monosyllabic words. This has nothing to do with my being a Neanderthal, although some would agree to that. It is because fourth is a hyperstatic global environment, which allows us to exploit context to our advantage. In other words, uh, that's a big fancy phrase, uh, basically saying that um, start and finish are specific to this definition of slurp. In a way, you can kind of think of this as, as a private definition, even though it's not really. Um, because later on, as you'll see, we're going to redefine these uh, for another purpose. Um, and it makes perfect sense to be able to support that too, because um, what does start, you know, mean? What am I starting? Well, in this particular case, we're starting this, the buffer, and then we're going to eventually finish the buffer as well. And once we're w once we're finished with that, um, no further uh, activity on that buffer can can occur. All right, so let's go ahead and test this. Okay, so a few points here. One is the dot s command. That what that does is that prints the contents of the of the data stack, and we see here that uh, the contents has zero elements on it. 
this is a good thing because when fourth starts, you have zero elements on the data stack. Um, and likewise, when you load or execute a command, um, that basically says that we have perfect stack balance, meaning everything that gets put on the stack gets removed. And that's, that's a good thing. So when testing interactively, you should always use .s to check stack balance. For brevity of this video, I'm not always going to do that. Um, but it's, it's, you can kind of treat it as the backslash g operator in MySQL's command interpreter, if you're familiar with that. If not, don't worry about it. There's our address. Um, this is expressed in, as a negative number because it is a signed integer. Uh, that's how the question mark interprets things. And we see that we allocated 100 bytes. Now, if we, uh, if we demonstrate this, we notice, again, be, take note of the fact that these are negative numbers. We, sh we can see that our current compiler pointer here is 100 different uh, than the address of the, our buffer, which corroborates that value there. So we can see that this works out pretty well for our needs. Looks like everything is going good so far, so now we can actually concentrate on slurping the actual file in. We can go ahead and re-edit our file. And let's go ahead and make some changes. First of all, the act of reading is a, is a kind of, you can think of it as a kind of consumption, so we're going to give this the name gulp. Seems as good as any. When gulping, we're going to open the file, we're going to read the file, and then we're going to close the file in that order. Uh, there's really nothing else that we can do. Uh, so let's concentrate on opening the file first, since it's pretty obvious. If we're going to take our source file, which as you recall is specified here. Take our source file. It's going to be read only. I'm going to open that, throw any pending exceptions, and then we're going to store it in a variable called fh, which obviously stands for file handle. All right. The next thing we're going to do is uh, just for uh, sake of symmetry, we're going to go ahead and, and just write the code to close the file right now. And that's fairly simple. And then one last thing is to actually read. Now, before I go further, let it be known now that there are multiple ways of reading in a file in its entirety. <coughs> the first approach is to figure out the length of the file, pre-allocate that in the buffer using a lot, and then we're going to read in uh, the entire file in a single call to read file. I think it would be easier for me to chunk it in, say, a small amount of, of, of data at a time. Um, it may not be as obvious, but for me, it makes more sense. I don't know. I'm just weird that way. Because it basically says that um, basically I don't have to write quite so many definitions if I do that. So here's how this thing works, right? So begin and until, I think that's pretty obvious. We're, we're setting up a, essentially a, a do until loop here. Starting at the current compiler pointer, we're going to read in 4,096 bytes from this file handle, throw any pending exceptions that may possibly exist, and then we're going to pre-allocate that chunk. Um, that we've read in. So in other words, read file, when it returns, will give us an indication of how much data it actually read, um, very much like the Unix read function. And we're going to pre-allocate that, and we're, we're going to do this until we get nothing back. So in other words, when read file returns an actual read value of zero, that's when we know we've reached the end of file, and we're just going to keep running that loop until we do. So another thing to notice is um, I structure my code such that I have the names of words along the left column and their definitions along the right. Human eyesight is optimized for geospatial location, meaning when we look for something, we expect it to be at some place. In other words, um, you know, we expect that object to have a position. Likewise, this makes optimal use 
Uh, it allows us to pack a lot of code in a very, con uh, a very small amount of space, um, but at the same time, it's still very easy to read. Structurally speaking, it's identical to how most dictionaries are written. If you look up a, diction you know, a word in a dictionary, uh, it takes a very similar form. And not coincidentally, this is why in, in fourth, these are known as words, and these are known as definitions, and collectively, this is part of a dictionary. So the analogy holds. Also, it is no coincidence that this is precisely the notation that was used in the earliest assembly languages as well. Um, so basically, just remember that uh, being able to uh, treat things in a kind of tabular form really makes it easy for, for a human to read uh, and find things. Um, even though you may, you may look at this code and say, my god, that's all pure hieroglyphics to me, um, be aware that that's only because you're unaware of fourth as a language, but um, from a structural point of view, it's very obvious what is being defined and what its definition is. And that's a very important thing. That really does help a lot. All right, so our next step is to examine a, our temporary file here. I have actually already written a temporary file. <coughs> And it says, Mary had a tilde IW, little lamb, ampersand, it tasted great, inside angle brackets, in the tilde BW sandwich. We're going to find out what all these characters and whatnot mean a little bit later on. But for now, if you want, this is, this is what I'm using for my test, uh, for my test input. So let's go ahead and test what we have. Oops, open mouth, insert foot. We're going to go ahead and slurp. And we see that it's 70 bytes. How do we know, how big is it in the, in the uh, let's, in the file system? Let's find out. We see that we read in 70 bytes. The file is also 70 bytes, so that's a good check. And one last check. Let's make sure that the contents of the file actually matches. Mary had a tilde IW little lamb, ampersand, etc., etc. It looks like we have a match. So, so far, the, everything is going great. So, at this point, you've noticed that we've been switching applications back and forth. So, we'll have to exit from here. We'll go ahead and edit weave.fs, make our changes, exit, go back into G4, run our slurp. If, you know, that, that basically gets to be a drag, especially when you're developing stuff interactively. And I have to admit, there is a little bit of jealousy in the Lisp uh, domain here, and also Smalltalk, um, because their runtime environments, particularly Slime under Emacs, uh, allows for a uh, large amount of automation uh, when uh, editing programs interactively and then uh, being able to uh, get programs, you know, interactive debugging and things like that, it really saves a lot of time not having to exit the editor, not having to exit the program, not exit having to exit this, you know, just it really streamlines the process. So what I'm going to do, very simply, I'm going to write a program to emulate this. This is uh, a little bit of black voodoo magic here. Although once you're familiar with it, it uh, becomes pretty self-evident. So what happens here, this whole string I'm going to evaluate as though I would type it in at the fourth prompt itself. And what this is doing is I'm executing a word called dash 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 marker dash dash dash. <coughs> which then is immediately followed by the recreation of a new marker. Now, in order to understand what this does, we need to understand what marker dash 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 marker dash 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 does. Marker is a defining word. It is used to create an entry in the dictionary which whose purpose is to checkpoint the current state of the dictionary. This checkpoint, when executed, will restore the dictionary back to that particular state. Voila, that's what that does there. So what we're doing is we're restoring the dictionary to its previous state and then taking another check mark. 
in, 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 so basically, in order for this to work, we have to bootstrap the process by manually invoking marker here. So basically, every time we execute the word empty, we backtrack our, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not backtrack, we, we restore our dictionary back to this point here. And then we execute another marker, which brings us here. So at this, what this is essentially doing is recycling dictionary space. If we didn't do this, every time we compiled our program would uh, result in additional space consumed because it compiles on top of itself. Remember, fourth is hyperstatic global environment, uh, and this is the key enabling feature to making that happen. So what we're going to do is I'm going to define an edit compile run sequence, um, which whereby we just say we edit the file and then we run it because compiling is automatic. Every time the fourth compiler sees, or I'm sorry, every time the fourth interpreter sees colon, it commences the compiler. So here I'm compiling a word called edit, which will perform this action running uh, my editor on weave.fs. And then when it sees the semicolon, it terminates the compiler. So that's it, we're done. Um, and likewise in run, we're going to include this file. And there you have it. So basically, in when loading this program, the compiler itself runs four times, one for each of these definitions. And then uh, we're going to establish our marker. And what this will allow us to do if now that we start G fourth with Go, we can now run ECR, which brings us, as you can see, into our program. When we exit it, it's great. It, we're dropped right back into fourth. We can uh, run our, our slurp program. We can re-edit and re-exit. Oops, something happened. Notice that we're redefining things. Let's go back and fix that. So we're basically telling the dictionary, OK, empty everything out. Let's start from new, and then we can recompile. And as you can see, everything seems to be working again. Just to confirm, there's our, our compiler point. Go ahead and do this a couple times. And we can see uh, it hasn't budged an inch. So we know that we're recycling our memory uh, correctly now. So uh, basically, any time we run our weaver, we know that we consume a certain amount of memory, and empty allows us to recycle that. And so that's what we've just implemented there. So let's get to work on processing our data. But before we can process, we know that we can slurp. Uh, in fact, we can type this out. We know that the data is there. So let's actually go ahead and So basically, every time we run, now slurp gets executed. So at this point, slurp has already been executed, which we can confirm like so. All right, so now that we can get to work on, on processing our data uh, on a character-by-character on a character basis, um, to begin, as we've already done here, we've dumped and made sure that our buffer is correct. Now what we can do is step through this character by character and, and figure out what we need to do uh, in various special circumstances. So in Lisp code, bef uh, before I get into this, how, how the, the burgeoning philosophy of fourth code, in Lisp, code is data. That is your burgeoning philosophy, particularly when dealing with macros. Uh, this allows Lisp to trivially manipulate code using the same constructs you'd use to manipulate any other data. In fourth, as uh, which has its own analog, which is uh, data is code. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're not going to be manipulating code as data. We're going to be taking data and treating it as code. Um, in other words, we're going to be writing an interpreter for this. Um, we cannot use Forth's built-in interpreter, at, this, at least at this point, because it is word-centric. 
Um, but what, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to um, process this in a character-centric way because that is how HTML works. <coughs> <coughs> By default, any characters we find in the input string must be passed to the output string. In other words, Mary had a um, you know s little lamb, um, it tasted, and so forth. Like these need to be passed through to the output. Uh, verbatim. So let's go ahead and start off with that most basic of requirements. All right, so we're going to start at the beginning of the string every time we want to process this. And we want to make sure that we're within the bounds of the buffer as well. In other words, we don't want any uh, any buffer overflow action happening here. Here we're computing the address of the byte that we're going to be interpreting. And then we're going to consume it when we're done with it. So let's start by defining our variable offset. And again, as, pre as previously indicated, our default behavior is to simply just dump the character to the screen. It should be very, very simple at this point. All right, so we've, go ahead, um, we've gone ahead. Now, mind you, offset and interpret are ANSI fourth, or I'm sorry, G fourth defined words, so we're always going to be seeing these words, these redefinitions. Um, it has, as you can see here, nothing else is being redefined, so, but that's okay, because we don't need the, the normal definitions that GeForce provides. So um, if we type process, we should find that the contents of the file is displayed on the screen. And sure enough, there it is in all its glory. Now, the thing is, HTML requires certain characters, certain key characters, to be escaped. At least for my needs, the only characters that I need escaped are less than, greater than, and ampersand signs. So let's go ahead and implement that. So we're going to do a check. If our character is an ampersand, well, we're going to discard that. There's no point in doing in doing that. And we're going to end. We're going to write write out our entity. And we're going to do the same. We're going to follow the same template for our other characters. And again, by default, we're just going to be emitting. Now, our entity basically con uh, consists of an ampersand. followed by the word uh, that we're going to bracket, followed by a semicolon. <coughs> so basically, any time that we want to uh, emit the ampersand uh, entity, it's going to be ampersand AMP semicolon. So let's go ahead and make that change. And now we can test. And sure enough, that's exactly what we see here. Now, we can edit the contents of our source input file from within G4 using the system word. Um, as, as we've indicated, we've actually already done that. When we see edit, we can already see that we're doing this. Um, if you want, at this point, you can go ahead and make, make some changes. And the way you can do that is Etc. And you can go ahead and make whatever changes you want in here. Save that, and then you can. Uh, the quickest way to reprocess is to just do that and then reprocess. So before going further, I'd like to refactor the the code that we just typed in a little bit. For starters, we have a colon definition that exceeds um, a rule of thumb, which basically says no more than two lines per definition. So here we have a definition with four lines. So let's go ahead and refactor this. And let's
let's see here. So the first thing I'm going to do is this. We're going to have either an ampersand or less than or greater than, and if it's none of uh, if it is none of the above, we'll go ahead and emit. So notice what's happening here. Okay. When we attempt to interpret, we're actually calling additional words. So we have an extra item on our return stack. Um, so how do we do an early exit from this? And the, uh, the means by which we do an early exit is something called an R drop. So in order for forth to know, okay, I call this word and for whatever reason, it's not you know it's not the ampersand. We have to come back to this point here. The return stack is used to hold that information that says yes, this is where we go next. Our drop says discard the topmost item. In other words, um, let's go ahead and define our drop here. We're gonna pop the item off the return stack, and then we're gonna drop it. Now, an immediate word is very much like a macro. So what we're doing here is uh, if the word is in fact, I'm sorry, if the character is in fact an ampersand, we're just going to drop that character because it never appears in the output. We're going to uh, write out the AMP entity. And then we're going to say, OK, discard the rest of this definition. And then we're going to exit back to our process, which will take us right there. Confused? Probably. It's not exactly the, uh, the most obvious code, uh, for a beginner at least, but for someone who's a little bit more advanced, this type of code really helps in, in legibility. Even if you don't understand the, the precise logic of this, it should be self-evident when reading this definition. And this is the important reason why I did that. Interpret either an ampersand or a less than or a greater than and in all other cases, emit the character to the, to the screen. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. We see that our output is identical to what it uh, was before, so we know that our logic works correctly. Now, there is still a little bit of, of duplication here. And what I'm about to show you is a little bit more advanced um, because we're actually defining new syntax in the process. So at this point, I'm kind of showing off, really. I'm going to refactor all these dupes and, and ifs and you know R drops and so forth into a single definition. It's not going to look exactly the same because what's happening is, um, OK, so uh, we're going to compare our, our characters. And if they're the same, we're going to drop that character. Then we're going to call the continuation of, uh, of the rest of the definition. We're going to pass that to entity. And then we're going to uh, return from that. Now, mind you, here. This is uh, because we're popping things off of the return stack. We have, um, oh, how can I put it? We, ha we have two return addresses which we're consuming. Uh, one is going to be the return address from here. So basically, uh, what's happening here is when we call either and, for example, we're going to push the value of the ampersand on, on the stack. And this word is going to invoke here. 
So we're going to do the, our comparison. And if they match, we're going to drop. This R, uh, this R from call will result in the execution of this code here. In other words, we're going to put the string AMP on the stack. We're going to pass it to entity just like we did before. Now, because this consumed this, re this particular return address, if we were to just exit from this definition right now, we would actually end up right back here where we started. So this R drop is actually still very important. If the character does not match, however, we come over here and we do an R drop. And the reason we, we do an R drop is because we do not want to return here to the ampersand. We want to return here to the next alternation. So basically what we're doing is using the return stack in this definition in a kind of unstructured way. It, it's very, very similar to using go-tos. Um, but if you're familiar with scheme programming, this is a precisely equivalent to using continuations. Um, Forth kind of automates the whole call with, con call with current continuation because it directly exposes the return stack to the programmer. That allows this syntax, which as you can see is significantly easier to read, significantly easier to understand. Um, and so basically, the whole purpose of this exercise was to demonstrate how Forth can actually uh, create customized syntaxes uh, for your particular needs. And in this particular case, this is a mapping syntax. We want to map the ampersand to the amp entity. Likewise, we want to map the, uh, uh, the, the less than symbol to the LT entity, and likewise the greater than symbol to the GT entity. I did this only to prove a point. In, in reality, I would never go this far in, in actual production code. <laughs> um, but this is just to prove a point. It seemed like a perfect opportunity to do so. And uh, so if you had lots of special entities, um, for example, uh, if you had, uh, um, say, uh, an, a U umlaut character that you wanted to put in uh, in UTF-8 or, or whatever, this this system might end up being very useful for you, uh, especially as this list grows. But with only three elements, this is total overkill. Um, so don't think that this is considered the best possible code, because it's not. Um, but if we reprocess, we see that it still works. The logic holds. Um, the other thing is, remember that arrow there is context sensitive. So if we come back in here and we do a search for our arrow, um, this arrow has a fairly complex single line definition, but it supports these subsequent definitions perfectly. It is just the right language construct for the job. Um, however, if you attempt to apply this arrow someplace else in your program, it may not necessarily work. Um, because we see that the arrow takes a character and in, in a, a strange sort of way also takes um, a procedure which returns a string when executed as inputs and then proceeds to perform your, your uh, output mapping that way. Odds are likely that kind of, of mapping operator um, is, is not likely to be general purpose. So if you attempt to execute this arrow out of context, you're probably going to crash your program. So again, be aware that, um, again, because it's hyperstatic global environment, if you do need a mapping operator that is applies in a different context, that has different behavior, just redefine that arrow and then re-execute your, uh, your statements. It's, uh, it's very, very easy to do. It's very compact and works and uh, is, I find, much, much clearer uh, as well because um, in IDE environments, for example, one of the hardest things to do is to debug polymorphic calls. Um, here you can get not all of the benefits of true polymorphism, but a large subset of it, and it works out very well um, in, in the, in the uh, usual case. So our next step is to add a little bit more powerful commands. So let's go back and, and, and show you here. Um, We've replaced our entities, but we still ha we still don't know what these uh, tilde iws and tilde bws are. Well, as I indicated earlier in, in the in the video, 
Um, I use the tilde as an, as an escape character because it almost never appears in Python code. Um, so as a result, our next step is to add handlers for that and to, to enable the document writer to exploit a more powerful uh, form of markup by actually calling forth words from within the source document. And here again, we're seeing that, that uh, data is code, um, not, the, what, not the other way around. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump into the, uh, uh, well, actually, you know what, before we do that, let's start things simple. Let's just dump the command's name to the console. In other words, all commands by default um, print, their, print their name to the console. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, because forth is properly structured programming language, and because it does not store symbols, uh, uh, symbol references symbolically, like uh, Lisp does, uh, at least when making forward references, we do need to have a bit of refactoring work to move code around and so forth to make everything compile well. So we're going to go ahead and create a new thing. Uh, I'll call this, I'll put this here. It will be our command dispatcher. We're going to move our variable offset here because we're going to need to use it a little bit later on. So what do we do when we see a command? Well, we take the next token in the input buffer. We type it to the screen, and we uh, use a carriage return. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define a new thing. We're going to check to see if it's a tilde. If it is, we're going to drop that. It's going to be a command. We don't care about the rest of, of the uh, of the code of the alternations here. We're going to add that in there. Uh, let's see here. So, what is a token? A token is going to start at the current uh, address. We're going to seek to the next white space character, and then we're going to compute the length uh, of that of that substring. Then we're going to advance over the uh, advance over the uh, the, the uh, white space, which is going to be very simply this. And I know I've seen this phrase before. So let's go ahead and refactor here. Seeking to uh, the uh, seeking to the to the next white space is going to involve a loop. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our current character, while it is not a white space, we're going to advance and repeat as necessary. Something is not a white space if it is above character ASCII code 32. Our current character will start at address and we'll go ahead and fetch the current character. And by definition, our address is going to be our offset added to our current source input buffer address. And this gets busy to some additional refactoring here. And we see that address, this is actually, come on, uh, this is actually our current character. Now, when we interpret, <coughs> do, do, do. actually, in second thought, since interpreting always involves a character and always involves advancing, we're just going to optimize this. Optimize this, which allows us to condense that down to a single line, which is good. So interpretation, we take our current character, we advance over that, and then we have our decision tree here. And I think that should work. And it appears to be doing so. Remember that when we print out our command, it's going to type a carriage return. So we know that uh, our program is working. So Mary had, a, had an IW command, little lamb, ampersand, it tasted great in the BW 
command sandwich. So it looks like everything is working well for us. Um, and again, this little bit of refactoring actually made this a little bit easier to, to read because we're starting at the beginning and we can actually go one further. Well, not at the end of, of input, which we define like so. And there you have it. Well, not at end of input, interpret. It's very simple. It's very, you know, that's that's your uh, that's your uh, core process right there. And of course, uh, we know we're not at the end of input when our offset is less than the limit of our buffer. So, since we made a change here, let's go ahead and reprocess. Yes, it looks like everything is working well. So, let's see here. I'm just looking through my little set of notes here. Now that we can isolate fourth words to potentially execute, assuming that they exist at all, we can use gforth's find command to locate them in, in the current search order. Now, sfind is a gforth specific word. Not all fourths are going to have something like it. Um, most of all of them will have just a plain find word, but find is a little bit harder to use. It is entirely possible to define a, a, a layer, an abstraction layer. Uh, called sfind that uses find, but I'm just going to use gforth's uh, built-in functionality. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's see here, our uh, command, the first thing we're going to do is, after, okay, so once we have the token, we find it. If it is found, we're going to execute it. Otherwise, by definition, we're going to say it's an error. Now an error we're going to create some white space. We're going to print the name of the token. And then we're going to abort, saying that the command was not found. Printing the token involves getting the address of the token and the size of the token and typing it to the screen. And in order for that to happen, we need to have Our variable is established every time we see give token. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Now, when we process this, we should have an error. And sure enough, Mary had a, there's our IW. We have not defined it. The command was not found exactly what we expect. So our next step, obviously, let us define some commands. IW is going to be a word that uh, puts the subsequent word in italics. So let's go ahead and do that. And conversely, BW is going to be the same or bold. Actually, let's put a, a final space there so that we can maintain normal looking spacing in our program. So now, if we process, voila, we have what appears to be properly structured uh, subset of HTML. Now, we do have one small minor detail to address, and that is how the heck do we get this thing to output into a file? Now, if you're using Unix, one approach is to redirect the output of the program via shell syntax. Uh, but this is kind of patchy, and it makes using it from within third-party text editors like Vim or Emacs unnecessarily difficult. It's better if we can somehow capture what emit and type are producing and just dump them into a memory buffer. Uh, then we can write that buffer in toto to the desired output file in one fell swoop. But uh, first, let's test out our idea. Let's see if we can even revector uh, uh, emit and type. So our first step is to even check to see if they're vectorable. And we do see that because it is a deferred word. And likewise with emit, we find that this is also deferred. And we see that um, the uh, built-in versions of type and emit are the words surrounded by parentheses. This is actually a fairly common fourth convention. <coughs> and uh, 
we're going to exploit that in our program. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a set of vectored output words. And we're going to do something similar here. B, the, we're going to use B dash as a, as a prefix to indicate that it is buffered. Um, eventually, obviously, it will be buffered. But first, first uh, to start with, what we're going to do is we're just going to put stars around things. I happen to know that that's ASCII code uh, third, uh, 42, but just to make things explicit. Then we're going to emit the actual the actual character. Likewise, uh, since everything that we're going to be doing is uh, dependent on character by character interpretation, I'm going to redefine type in terms of emit. Now, the reason type and emit are, are defined separately is for efficiency reasons. It's oftentimes very uh, much more efficient to type a buffer than it is to emit a single character. So usually you're, you're going to find that emit is defined in terms of type rather than vice versa. Um, but because we don't want to do that, we're concerned with individual characters, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swap that and say that type is now defined in terms of emit. Also notice that um, I'm using the, the basic vector, you know, the entry point for emit. I'm not, I'm not calling b-emit directly. Um, I see that, that there's really no benefit in doing that and actually this gives me a kind of a, um, uh, if I wanted to define a different kind of emit, I can just reuse this b-type uh, definition and uh, it should just work even if it is a little bit slower. So buffered is very simple. What we're going to do is take the address of B emit and we're going to say that is the new emit. And likewise B type is type. So there's our buffered versions. We've established that. Let's go to uh, interactive mode here. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to restore the original definitions. And let's reformat to make things a little bit easier to read. So now we can test this. If we go into buffered mode, everything should be surrounded by stars. And in Bade we see exactly that. If we switch back into interactive mode, text looks normal. So that's good. It looks like our idea has merit, and so we can go ahead and move forward with our with our plan. Uh, so let's work on the memory buffer now. And likewise, we're going to have an address for our output buffer, and we're going to have a variable for the length of our output buffer. Um, and just as before, we're going to use com uh, compiling to actually place the bytes into the buffer. And just when you thought it was safe, we're going to redefine our start and finish, just like I said we would. So to start with, we're going we're to uh, declare the, the beginning of our buffer, and then we're going to switch to buffered mode so that all subsequent output gets dumped into our buffer. So how many times can you say the word buffer in the same sentence at the same time? And when we finish, we're going to compute the length. And we're going to switch back to interactive mode. So that, when we quit, uh, go back to fourth, we're, we're, we see that, uh, OK, looks like we've redefined start and finish now, which we can see confirmation of here and here, which is good. Um, we expected that, of course. So let's go ahead and test this. If we if we uh, use process, we we still get dumped to the screen. And just to confirm, you know, we still have garbage values. Uh, there's no point in checking the length if our address is zero, of course. So let's start the process and finish. All right. So we get no output to the screen, at least. We find that our output is uh, apparently has an address, and it is 86 characters long. 
And if we take our uh, if we take our current compile address and figure out the difference between our current compile pointer and the start of the buffer, we also find that it is 86 bytes as well. So it looks like all of our logic is is uh, apparently correct. And just as a final confirmation, we can print this out as a string. And voila, it looks to be identical to here. OK, so now the next step is to actually, now that we have our buffer, we can now actually write this thing out to disk. And we call that process, or at least I do, spewing, which involves opening the file, writing to the file, and closing the file. You see a pattern here? I mean, basically what I'm doing when I code in fourth is um, I code in a very specific, uh, a, a very literate way, a very conversational way. It, it is not, it, it, there's really no emphasis on functions. There's really no emphasis on uh, data structures. There's really no particular emphasis on, um, you know, uh, abstraction for abstraction's sake. It just kind of happens. It all just kind of flows together. And if you'll notice, nowhere in my code is there a stack comment. There's no need for it. The stack is kept so shallow that you can tell immediately by looking at one particular definition what is on the stack, what is needed, and what the, what is res the result of executing the code. Um, so let's go ahead and open up our output file. I'm going to use create file instead of open file because I want the file to be emptied upon open. And writing the file involves simply taking our output buffer, dumping it to our file handle, and throwing any pending exceptions. Unlike read file, write file does not uh, produce a result, uh, a, a result indicating how many bytes were actually uh, written. I personally consider that a, a uh, design defect of ANSI 4. Uh, that is the one element that I'm not happy about, but them's the role, uh, you know, them's the rules. So, not much I can do about that. So we'll go ahead and do a little bit of refactoring work here. Let's give that a shot. Oops, looks like I haven't defined a word. Out file. And sure enough, I did not. <coughs> <coughs> which I'm going to define as b.html. Why not? Works as good as any. So we've already slurped. We're going to start process. We're going to finish that, and then we're going to spew the results. So let's go ahead and test that. I've already done this several times, and as you can see, it seems to work. Uh, where am I here? View page source. Uh, I don't know if you can see that here, but if not, I apologize. But here at the bottom, we have Mary had a little lamb, etc. It looks like properly formed HTML subset. I hope you can see that. And that was my IRC window. Okay, so now it's time to wrap all this up into a single cohesive output or I'm sorry a single cohesive command rather and we do that here what we're gonna do is we're gonna start we're gonna format our output <coughs> excuse me and we're gonna finish which means this gets renamed to format and then down here we're going to define a higher level word, and we're going to call that weave. We're going to slurp our input file. We're going to process that file. We're going to spew it. And when we're done, we're going to, uh, every time this program gets executed, we're going to weave. So I'm going to delete that for now because we're still doing interactive testing. I'm going to clear the screen here and weave. 
just to make sure I'm going to hold down the shift key and click restart um, reboot and ha ah, something went wrong so let's find out the first thing is did we implement there's our problem something didn't get read incorrectly Okay, so let's go ahead and find out what, what's happening here. Let's go ahead and debug this here. Okay, so we know that we're slurping now. Process, restart, format, and finish. Start, we go into buffered mode. That's very bizarre. this break. So we slurp, we process, and then we spew. We know slurping works. Process there seems to be a problem with. Ah, that's what it is. Okay, here it is. Because our desired start and finish fall below this definition of process. And you can confirm that because forth is a properly structured language. So what happens is every time you use a definition it has to have it has to have been defined first so to find out what particular version of start we're using we simply search, search backwards and we see here that it's the wrong one so let's go ahead and, and uh, the solution to this of course is to just move this entire block up here all right let's go ahead and give that a shot first let's make sure Go ahead and weave. Okay, there's no output to the screen. That's good. All right, we have address. We have our output buffer. And we have our output. So there you have it. <coughs> a quick little brain fart on my part. And uh, basically, we, have, we now have a program written in forth. We can now basically shift this. We can remove our empty. And down here, you can say weave by and we're done um, so now basically as you can see here um, did I do this in the wrong directory I did I did this in the wrong directory but that's okay um, so basically now if you wanted to do this you can say g4 weave.fs boom and it's done it, it, with the exception of these warnings which we can actually turn off easily enough warnings off. And there you go. And just to test, we can go ahead and define uh, a statement here with the command not yet defined. Mm, very strange. Why did that happen? should have printed a message and immediately dumped to the screen. Well, we can actually debug this by removing this, finding out just what is going on. And we see that the command was not defined, 
it exited and it aborted the program before it had a chance to flush its buffers. Okay, that makes that makes some sense. There is there is a way, I'm pretty sure, to handle that situation. Um, basically, that would involve uh, wrapping this in an exception handler block, basically a try block or a catch block, and uh, handling the error like that. But I can already see I'm over an hour long here, so I'm not going to bother with that particular uh, uh, error handling. But there you have it. I mean, this is essentially the core of this is essentially the core of the fourth um, text preprocessing application that I had written uh, for my for my particular needs. Um, actually, if I come in here and I show you what I have, the commands that I've written, I actually have a very large number of commands which I have defined. Uh, there's IW, which you can see here. Um, it's, not strictly, uh, it's not strictly the same as what you've seen in this video, um, but uh, they're there. And if anybody wants to uh, have more information on how I came about to uh, develop these, um, you know, I can certainly do a quick follow-up video. Uh, pro it'll probably be at most 30 minutes long. Uh, so there you have it. Um, hopefully this has been useful to you. And uh, I appreciate hearing back from you, uh, yay or nay, uh, and whether or not you'd like to see other uh, over-the-shoulder type videos. All right, looking forward to hearing from you, and I'll catch you later.